weeks, it looks like the Santos saga is finally coming to an end. A scathing report by the House Ethics Committee detailed all the ways New York Congressman George Santos deceived his donors and misused campaign funds for personal expenses, like luxury trips and gambling, Botox, his rent, and an OnlyFans account. Yep, you heard me. Only fans. Santos called the report a smear, announced he's not running again for office, and expects to be expelled soon. And he said that Congress was full of felons, but that he had become the Mary Magdalene of the U.S. Congress. And unto me did I find, with finances overflowing, that nay, twas my duty to spend on Only fans, in the name of the Father, the Son, and my holy voters. This would make him only the sixth person in U.S. history to be expelled from the U.S. Congress, after three who were expelled for being disloyal for fighting for the Confederacy, two who were expelled for being convicted of federal crimes, and now Georgie's Hermes habit would make him number six. Can I still get the Botox covered? We got a full show! We'll talk the Israel-Hamas truce, Argentina elects a guy as president whose nickname is El Loco, the riots in Dublin and elections in the Netherlands, three college students of Palestinian descent were shot in Vermont, and 41 workers trapped in a highway tunnel in India were rescued. Before we start though, please hit the subscribe button below, click the notification bell, and like this video. Israel and Hamas came to a truce, which took effect on Friday, November 24th. They agreed to a four-day pause in hostilities, which was extended for two days. In the first four days, 50 Israeli hostages, mostly women and young children, were released in exchange for 150 Palestinian prisoners. And then for every day the pause is extended, an additional 10 hostages are released for 30 Palestinian prisoners. In addition, 20 foreign hostages, most of whom were Thai workers, were released in a separate deal brokered with Bangkok. The Israeli hostages were not treated well under any circumstance. Of those whose stories we have, they were violently abducted, most were beaten upon arrival, most were kept in the dark 24 hours a day, and they were given very little food. The Palestinian prisoners included at least 90 who were held for serious offenses like attempted murder, placing explosive devices, shooting at people, and throwing bombs or Molotov cocktails. Others had more vague or smaller offenses like throwing stones, and the majority are male teenagers aged 16 to 18. However, over half of the Palestinian prisoners were never charged. The truce also includes the daily delivery of much-needed humanitarian relief and fuel into Gaza. Overall, the truce is good news, and a few things led to it. First, you had intense Israeli military operations that increased pressure on Hamas. Second, the hostage families built a loud grassroots movement to pressure the Israeli government to prioritize hostage releases. And finally, you had the roles of the mediators. Qatar was the main mediator, and they were able to play that role mainly because they support Hamas. They allow their leaders to live and make billions of dollars in Doha, and they help finance Hamas. But Qatar is also a strong partner of the United States. In fact, the largest U.S. airbase in the Middle East is in Qatar. And they've kind of fashioned this weird role for themselves as mediator in a lot of negotiations that include thugs, like Iran and the Taliban as well. So between Qatar, the U.S., and Egypt, this deal was able to be brokered and maintained. The question is, could this truce turn into a permanent ceasefire? Well, Netanyahu has promised the war would continue. But I asked you all on Instagram what you thought, and almost half of you thought it could turn into a longer-lasting deal. I don't believe we're headed for a permanent ceasefire right now, because Hamas still has a large number of hostages, and because Israel's military will need to go to Khan Yunus in the south of Gaza if it really wants to defeat Hamas. However, I do believe that Israel's planned effort to advance south will be delayed, and that their tactics might become more targeted. The U.S. is clearly concerned about the civilian death toll and the damage and destruction to Gaza's buildings so far. And so they've told Israel they don't support them advancing to the south unless or until they've accounted for all displaced Palestinians in Gaza, which apparently Israel has been receptive to. On November 19th, Argentina elected Javier Millet as president, and his nickname is El Loco. Yep, don't look at me, I didn't come up with it. Millet was a musician turned TV personality who used to say crazy things on air, and then he was elected to Argentina's Congress in 2021 as a libertarian economist. And I don't wanna judge, but he looks like Wolverine. I think we should dollarize the economy. I am also a tantric sex instructor. If only that were an exaggeration. But that doesn't really sum him up, because so much of what he says is so extreme. On one hand, he wants to improve Argentina's economy by replacing the peso with the dollar, which is probably a good idea. But then he also wants to cut off trade with Argentina's top trading partners, and he wants to legalize organ sales. I mean, what could go wrong? He carries around a chainsaw to convey his plan to slash funding by closing over a dozen government ministries and the central bank. He also wants to abolish public health, public education, and social welfare. And he has promised to abolish abortion, has portrayed the LGBT LGBTQ plus community as a menace to society, and he's a climate denier. So how did he win this election? Geek out with me. 
Argentina's economy has been in crisis for years. Its peso has tumbled and inflation has soared past 140% this year alone. 40% of Argentina's 45 million citizens live in poverty. More than 20 of the largest global firms have left the country, leaving numerous people unemployed. And Argentina's current leadership is riddled with corruption and fraud. Millet won this election because he's the opposite of the current government, which has proven to be ineffective in pulling Argentina out of its financial despair. And so citizens have put their hope in someone who seems totally totally disconnected from the current government, and whose wild ideas seem exciting for a nation feeling like things can't get any worse. But experts say that Millet's radical ideas and political goals could bring on too much change too fast, which could lead to massive social unrest, union strikes, and political violence. And a few weeks ago, a group of more than 100 leading economists from around the world signed a letter to Argentina warning that Millet's policies could lead to even more economic devastation. We're hoping that Javier Millet got all of his stunts and performances out on the campaign trail, but it feels like Argentina is on track for anything but a calm four years. Recent events in Dublin and the Netherlands are highlighting a concerning anti-immigrant trend in Europe. In Dublin, three children and two adults were seriously injured in a knife attack outside of a primary school. The police never revealed the suspect's identity, but rumors spread that it was an immigrant. And so far-right agitators rallied people on social media in an anti-immigrant agenda, leading to 500 people who rioted in Ireland's worst rioting in decades. The riots left seven vehicles torched and 13 properties and stores were attacked and damaged. The Prime Minister of Ireland quickly condemned condemned the riots and said the nation had two attacks that day. First was on innocent children, and the second on society and the rule of law. Now moving over to events in the Netherlands the same week, a right-wing populist party won most of the seats in the national parliament, which means its leader, Geert Wilders, could become the next Dutch prime minister. He has a number of far-right policies, like he wants to end military support for Ukraine, and he supports removing Netherlands from the EU. But a strong feature of his campaign was its anti-Islam stance. He wants to ban the Quran and abolish mosques and Islamic schools in a country where 5% of the population is Muslim. Now, he's unlikely to be able to do this anyway, since the Dutch system of coalition government means he'll have to compromise, and it's not like he makes the laws alone. But between Dublin and the Netherlands, it's a sign you're seeing more and more anti-immigrant sentiment in Europe, which could be very dangerous if it grows further. Three college students of Palestinian descent were shot in Vermont by their originally childhood friends who grew up in Ramallah in the West Bank. Two are U.S. citizens and one is a legal resident, and they were visiting one of the students' grandmothers for Thanksgiving. They went out for a walk one evening around 6.30 p.m., and the shooter approached them as they walked by his apartment building. He said, I've been waiting for you, and then shot each one of them. It hasn't been declared as a hate crime, but it might be, and the students' lawyers argue it is because they were speaking Arabic and two of them were wearing kafia scarves when they were shot. They've arrested the suspect, and thankfully they all survived, but one of these students was shot in the spine and has lost movement in his legs. This story hit me hard for a few reasons. In part because I'm a professor, and I don't know these students, but it feels like it could have been any one of mine. They went to Brown, Trinity, and Haverford, and according to their moms, they like to discuss math and history. One of them is an EMT and a track star. So basically, this guy shot a trio of friends who like to nerd out. It also hit me as a mother, thinking that you're sending your child abroad to study, somewhere that's typically safer than the West Bank. And then this murderous thug approaches your children, and there's nothing you can do about it. And it also hit me because this is not who we are. People do everything to come here to study, especially those who believe in American values. And that's a strength of the United States, and it works to our advantage. And so when a criminal does something like this, it undermines our country and our reputation. So for hurting these young men this way, and making the U.S. look like some kind of hateful banana republic, the guy who shot these students is on my shit list this week. I think we all need some good news. A group of 41 men were rescued this week from a partially collapsed highway tunnel in India after being trapped for 17 days. They had been building a tunnel through a Himalayan mountain when the tunnel collapsed, likely due to a landslide, which is common in these mountains. Now, thankfully, a couple of pipes were drilled through the debris right after so that they could get oxygen, food, and medicine. But for two weeks, rescuers tried to get to the men by using large machines. And after one of them got stuck in the rubble, things started to look pretty bleak. So then a group of rat hole miners were called in. Rat hole mining is a primitive way of extracting coal, where miners manually dig very narrow vertical shafts into the earth and then go down them to get the coal. It's been banned almost everywhere, including in India, because it's not safe and because the method is very damaging to the environment. But in this case, it saved the day. These miners used simple tools like a handheld drill, pickaxes, and shovels to create a narrow passageway to get to the trapped men. And thankfully, it worked.
Thanks, geeks. Before you go, I want to let you all know that the show is now on podcast. Same show, just a version for the ears. So if you don't have time to watch the full video or you're just more of a podcast kind of person, then make sure to listen to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And actually, while you're at it, follow us there and leave us a review since it helps enormously. In the meantime, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and drop us a comment below. And let us know if you have a question or something you want us to talk about. Stay fabulous, geeks. Thank <laughs> you.